Okay, so it's Are we gonna share the screen or are we gonna oh, use the camera? Share the screen. Uh you share the screen would be share the screen would be the the best because I've got a whole lot on on the PowerPoint. Uh, and this is what Blackboard is. Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to this uh, lunchtime uh, lunchtime talk. And uh, I'm going to make use of this following an hour, maybe 15 minutes, to quickly review the kind of history. The purpose is not really the review of digital signal processing. And the purpose is to have an outlook and point uh, some of, of you, if you're interested, to some sort of a new and emerging techniques or, or kind of resource available around us. So see how DSP is going to move forward and, uh, and uh, do we still need DSP or are we still going to have DSP as a terminology in some five years to come? So we are all acousticians. We all know so that in most of the established acoustics research institutes, we have people always have a small branch of some some kind of gurus called the DSP, DSP, DSP people. And uh, you know, if a large institute, then a small group. If a reasonably small group, then there will be one or two people looking at the DSP aspect of of acoustics. So it has always been a sub branch of acoustics, and um, and th this is where we start from. Okay, we move the the the, the slides forward to see what we are going to discuss today. We we are going to have a little bit background of DSP and its association with acoustics, and have a quick look at its evolution path, how it DSP evolved over time. And we start from talking about traditional filters, then we move on to optimal filter and the adaptive filter. Then machine learning or some sort of AI kicked in in 1990s. Neural network processor, PPU these days, tensor processing unit is now a very hot topic because uh, Google announced its first TPU, which is a CPU essentially, but based upon the artificial neural network architecture. So the single instruction can execute the whole lot of evaluation from the input all the way to output. Every single processing, they don't call it unit port, is based upon the activation function. So TPU was first announced in, nine, uh, in year 2016. That was called first generation of TPU. And then now the third generation of TPU has just been announced the last month, probably on 16th of May. The third generation is much, much more powerful, even though it is only a 28 nanometer chip with about 35 watts power consumption. And there are some key techniques being pumped into the audio DSP, making the DSP no longer a signal processing, but informatics indeed. We are facing the big data challenge. We are facing the cloud computation facility. And uh, we have some sort of AI returned, and then we have some advanced, truly advanced DSP techniques. So the key new techniques being involved in modern DSP, we also have four sort of a major capability in addition to traditional DSP. So the information ex extraction is definitely something relatively new. It's not that new. Though, because traditional DSP, low pass, high pass, whatsoever, you integrate in the chip or you, you carry that out using a computer program, input is a signal, output is slightly modified, the augmented signal. Input is your speech, output, perhaps, even if you do the speech morphing, a female's version of your speech or whatsoever, but signal in, signal out. 
So signal processing. So you process the signal, process the food. You put it in the machine, that's food. You take it out from the machine, it's still food. So what's that? It's a physical process. There is no chemical process ongoing there. You mix them, you chop them, and whatever you do. The signal in, signal out. These days, the ESP is no longer signal in, signal out. Signal in, something else out. It's a chemical process. So you put in what? You put in vibration-related analog signal, your speech. What you get out, perhaps, is the text if you talk about speech to text. So what is that? Signal, audio signal in, text out. Is that audio signal processing? We generally term it as audio signal processing, but it's a totally change of regime because it's no longer a physical process, it's a chemical process. Speech in, something else out. So broadly, I term it as informatics. So information extraction. Information mining is slightly different. It's, it's, it's based on cloud, it's based, based upon big data. So if I capture your voice, can I search all over the internet to find a exact match of your voice? So dig out whatsoever. Then is it possible, you know, for forensic purpose, under the law enforced application, can you capture all the mobile voice communication, then pin down this person, pin down his number, then track his activities? Okay, it's scary if, if, if you've got these activities, just like that. video camera all over the places, microphone all over the places, we live in a big prison, or that, that sort of things. But this is reality. It's technically possible. So information mining and decision making and decision support. And certainly when we try to get acoustic footage, acoustic signals, and we sometimes intend to make some kind of decisions. For example, if a robot hears somebody shouting, help, help. So what should that particular robot do? So make a decision. Is that the fake one? Is that a real genuine one? And what sort of thing? What kind of help? Should I go get a fire extinguisher? Or should I go, go, go and, uh, uh, and ring the, the, the ambulance and the decision support? And also information interpretation. We got information from acoustic signal, acoustic signature. We're going to make some interpretation. For example, music information retrieval, then we, we will have to apart from directly translate the acoustic signal into maybe score. And we probably need to understand a bit more what is the mood of the music, what is the style of the music, or anybody else composed in a similar way, or is that man composed or machine synthesized? So all these kind of things. So the four major capability or the kind of challenges ahead makes DSP no longer signal in, signal out. So I would suggest we better call it acoustic formatics. It's no longer physical process. A quick review would probably, and we have kind of a few milestones in this business. And uh, we start from signal modeling. This started way, way early, way, way early in the age where the transmission of signal becomes useful. Basically, the start of use electricity to carry information. So first of all, signal processing as a discipline started from signal transmission. We tried to model the transmission line of signal. Probably, in most of the cases, that's a low-pass filter. Because if you talk about two parallel lines, and there is a capacitance in it, in, in between these two. Fundamentally, that's a capacitor. Maybe it's a low pass then. Starting from the modeling of signal transmission, we start to think of, OK, can we make use of the transmission system somehow to alter the signal purposefully? Then we start to 
move on to the so-called synthesis. We try to purposely design. In the first instance, we try to transmit a signal. The transmission line is something we must have, we must use, but we certainly see some artifacts of that. Maybe a low pass effect on the signals we don't physically like, for example, 10 noi, if we are gonna run the cable uh, to two kilometers long or whatsoever, then we probably lose some high frequency. Yeah, and um, I don't know. But then 10 noi, would they, would they actually from train station to the next one, if there is any wired, maybe telephony system, and you lose some high frequency when the, when the relays are getting longer, longer and longer. And we start to realize that the transmission system is a system which has got some artifacts. Later, we find we can purposefully implement these artifacts, but we use it for purpose. Then we start to synthesize such a transmission and that becomes analog filter. And when, when this moves on to the digital era, then digital processing kicks in, taking a lot of different kinds of advantages. Essentially, it's a cheap version. Anything digital is a cheaper version because instead of getting the whole picture, we sample. We only take a slice of those. Uh, in the 70s, optimal filter design starts. Essentially, what we say is instead of low pass, high pass, trying to find the existing polynomia to, to, to fit the kind of desirable frequency response or phase response, we set some optimal objectives. We try to design a filter using some optimization routine to achieve our design objectives. And a slightly advanced version of optimal filter based upon optimal filter is the adaptive filter, meaning that the filter will change its characteristics or internal parameters and the fit to the environment fit to the environment, that's adaptive filter. Machine learning then kicks in at that time and people call it AI, actually it's an inspired system, biologically inspired, but it's not a engineering replication or bio computing. It is kind of inspired system. I will give you a bit sort of uh, uh, more information a bit later on. And then Nowadays, the true digital signal processing, this is classic stuff, this is modern stuff, optimal filter, adaptive filter, and a part of the machine learning, and the truly current and the future signal informatics or acoustic informatics is no longer these sort of things. So goodbye to all these, and we welcome a new era of signal informatics, which means extraction, mining, decision support, and interpretation. So that is the future to me. And um, okay, we particularly, we are gonna put a bit of emphasis on machine learning because I started a PhD working on machine learning and the super of this gentleman over there is reading his mobile phone because he gets bored. And we, we worked on the machine learning at that point of time that was very hot. Anything with artificial neural network will get founded. So I was lucky enough to get enough money to, to, to keep the work going. And, um, but after that, shortly after that, uh, I, I got quite frustrated because the, 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 the so-called uh, sort of artificial intelligence or machine learning, I, I keep on saying that machine learning is not artificial intelligence. I will tell you the reason, was, 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 was dying at one moment in time because everybody knows the limitation of artificial neural networks and the related methods. Once upon a time, that was that hot, just like the 70s, everybody wears big flares, anything like that in the street. It's very eye-catching and you definitely get found. But these days, we all have skinny fit. It's, 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 it's 10, 15 years after the first tide of neural network. So the big flare died and the skinny fit kicked in. And I was frustrated because he has got other branches of interest, so he survived well. But now my second life returned because the AI, the so-called machine learning AI whatsoever, quickly received now again by industry, especially big players. The benefit came from the big data and the cloud computing because these were the bottleneck and where, where, where kind of um, confined the then AI or then machine learning techniques. 
to a very small scope. Now we got big data. Now we got we got much much more facility to to do all sorts of things, and we have a true need. So, signal and system, very old old talk, and the signal. And the system starting from a signal modeling. So how do we model the signal? And we've got the various ways of modeling signal. It is a bit of a frustration to me uh, because um, if you read the classic textbooks, uh, we talk about various kind of signal modeling techniques, and uh, we, we we typically sort of start a book with okay, BC does not carry any information because there is no variance, and uh, as long as you see some some jumping up and down, it starts to carry some sort of information saying something. And uh, then in order to model the system, we typically have a variety of test signals for the single frequency, we got the cycle sine waves. And uh, we probably have for, for, for sweep, we can have triangular wave, and uh, we can have some periodic wave to emulate repeated something going forever, so we have periodic test signals. We're going to monotonic test signals, well, exponential. And uh, we, we have some stochastic uh, testing signals. For example, we can have random noise, etc., etc. And these are the standard test signals we talk about. When we come to reality, most of the signal we, 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 we see, we have, depending upon the nature and how it was generated. For machinery noise, we can get reasonably, we can get reasonably, we can get reasonably stationary because the rotation motion or whatsoever, periodic or quasi-periodic stuff. That's, you know, if you use some sort of a su uh, superposition of number of, of, of periodics, that works generally fine. But when we come to the most essential and the most prevalent everyday sound, which is speech and music, and that completely stochastic. And the existing model can hardly emulate them, the test signal. So the, the cheapest way is to use some sort of a parametric model or use some kind of a probabilistics model, for example, the Markov model. And the many kind of speech signal in a short duration may be reasonably modeled by a first order Markov process, the stochastic process. That's pretty much what it is it. And uh, then you got the representation. No matter how you represent them, you can represent them in time domain, in frequency domain, time frequency domain, in wavelets, and uh, in high order H space. That means nth dimensional representation, spatial representation of these signals. Just one way or another of rewriting it, but with an emphasis, with a benefit of perhaps easy handling. But no matter how you transform them, they are the they are literally literally the same thing. Are these all correct? So a set of signal there isn't a good deal. This is currently what the state of art is. If you read any sort of a systematic review for, for, for signal modeling, that's all you can find. Nothing more than that. But to me, this is a badly, badly ignored area. Because if you don't know how to model the source, you don't know how to handle them properly. So there is probably a lot to research into somehow to model it. This echoes some thoughts Trevor brought forward a while ago. And he, he, he kept on saying something. He wanted to model the source. But so far, he hasn't come to a solution yet. I'm going to kick him. and Come to a solution then, please. You try to model the source, he's going to fall asleep. Anyway, so it comes back to signal and the system. <laughs> All right, that's the way. That's the interactive way, just to keep you awake. Because I know, I know that's boring. So I have to keep you awake. You know, that's a way. Uh, signal and system modeling. So, what is a system? Um, there are a variety of systems. There are naturally existing systems, just like transmission line. There are synthesized a system that is designed to achieve our purpose and our, for our applications, and uh, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, I would like to slightly talk about the non-linearity. 
Non-linearity is certainly universal. Everything perhaps would involve a little bit. So that does the light ban? It, it can ban. We believe that's that will travel in 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 in, in straight straight lines. So non-linearity perhaps is universally true, but in the limited observation scope, we can approximately view it as as a linear one. But for purposely designed signal processors, we almost exclusively work on the linear time invariant system. There are theories being developed over the past, but they never gain any real application. They never gain it, but today we do, because most of the machine learning is heavily, heavily based upon the non-linear processing unit. The activation function is typically non-linear. We purposely introduce non-linear unit in it. But for the traditional FIR, IIR filter, there is no non-linearity being involved in such a system. Okay. We move on to the next one to, to start looking at it from various stage of development. And you see, these were about 1902. We got a funny first order low pass filter. Then we have, have a second order low pass filter. Whenever you get energy storage, you can change the frequency or phase. So these are something we are familiar with as early as that. When it comes to 1912, uh, vacuum tubes was made available. If anything, any R or C, uh, RLC, L or C energy storage devices built around an amplifier would have this or that kind of filtering effect. So actually, in theory, if you really want to say the active filter way started from where trials was made available. But in reality, that didn't start till the prevalent application of operational amplifier in perhaps 1960. When the first 741, the mu A741 mu A was introduced by AD, AD back in the 1960s, you got these kind of linear operational amplifier. We essentially build these RLC components around the amplifier to extend its low frequency sort of operation without resort to non-realistic or unrealistic resistors and capacitors. In the meantime, we can reasonably isolate the I output from the load effect to make the cascade design easier. So essentially, these are the active filters in 1960s. Then, then 1970s. 1970s, these things. This is exactly the same as what I had. Was a was a was a was a was a gift to me uh, in 1980s from my uncle who taught in America University for 30 years. It's a gift that was quite expensive. That that was kind of one and a half year of my then salary. It was the first. I still have it. I still have it. It's an Apple II with a Rockwell CPU clocked at one megahertz with 64 kilobyte of um, um, memory, and uh, uh, you know you got eight slots in it. The first slot typically you put in the graphic card, which is only 16 kilobyte, and uh, and there is uh, slot number 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 six. And which is connected typically to a printer. If you want to engage that printer, you just type in a, a hash PR hash seven, you activate that printer. And there is a built in uh, uh, assembler uh, and that it, it operates, it operates. There's also a, a, a built in uh, basic interpreted. And it can take this operating system called DOS 1.5, which was the one I have, 
and a two floppy disk, single-sided, single density, with a capacity of 143 kilobytes. I can remember all these vividly well. And the connecting of those were not always reliable. You need often quite a number of, of, of reboot, reboots, etc. So this is Rockwell 6502 based. And in the, due, uh, in the same time, uh, Z-Log announced that it's kind of a, a Z80 single board. It's an it's, it's a 8-bit process at 2 megahertz, which worked reasonably well. So these were the something around 1970s. Because these were entered into individual studies of academia, the true DSP started. So you need a lot of tweak. You need a lot of uh, try and errors. If you rely on like a, like a mainframe computer, you can hardly develop the SP algorithm. So essentially, when these were made available, and the people who used to teach signal and the system, analog filter design, these people move on to those kind of baby machine. Oh, I forget to mention TRS-80, which is German version, and the BBC2 computer, which are the similar uh, Z80-based stuff. And they are, they are really, really most useful stuff you know, for, for DSP. So I have this. I have this thing. I have that thing. I still have them. They both work. Still working. And in 1975, a series of books were published by these converted signal processors. They used to teach analog filter design and active filter design. They get on to these little digital babies. They start to digitize things. And, uh, and then a few, a few milestone books actually established the DSP as a discipline. As a discipline. So to name three big fellows, uh, Alan Oppenheim, everybody, you know, if you study into this, and Rabina Lawrence, and there is also Ben Gold, these three people, mostly from uh, Princeton and MIT. They started to write textbooks, advanced textbooks. They said these, these were advanced texts for, not even for senior year at that time, that's for, for, for postgraduate taught components. So the three major texts, they mark the starting era of the so-called DSP. Now digital signal processing, abbreviated by DSP. The DSP has been entered into dictionary. You can use it as a word. You do not have to spell it out. Because if you check the major dictionary, DSP has been entered as a, just like X-ray, you do not have to spell it all out. OK. So what does classical DSP do? That means in 1970s, in 1975s, to 1980, early 1980, uh, Lawrence, Allen, Ben, these people, uh, some of them, the must still alive. Essentially, for very traditional DSP, it does nothing. Tap delay line. This is an FIR filter. What you do is you send the signal into a tap of a number of delays. Who can do this? Registers. All you need to do is a number of registers, flip flop, which you operate by a clock, you can push the sample in one by one. And the first in, first out. Then take the signal out, give them specific weight, multiply by B1, B2, all the way to Bn minus 1. Put all the results together, add them, give it a gross sum. Add them all together, vomit it out. That's it. This is very similar to you got your direct sound. Delay a little bit, you get your first reflection with some attenuation due to absorption, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a filter, isn't it? You have an impulse directly get into output. We're subject to some attenuation. Then a delay subject to some attenuation, or actually you can do amplification. Add it to output so on and so forth. If you do this, you exactly get that kind of result. So very flexible, we can do all sorts of things. And this is a bit kind of less, this is a bit kind of less efficient because every single multiplication or delay has been utilized only once. Just like we get the first order 
or second order active filter, if we got number of those, we can cascade them together and then we can get much higher attenuation or whatsoever. But can we reuse the then fairly expensive digital hardware? So the idea is to get a signal to loop around and around, to re reuse the hardware. Now the recursive filter or the IIR filter, because this thing, if you apply an impulse, the output is limited, finite impulse response, FIR filter. If we try to get the output sent back and the loop out, then we got infinitely long impulse response, i.e. the hardware is reused for infinite number of time. So on and on forever. But certainly this, because it's limited lens, it's always bounded. For this, if anything involves feedback, if the loop gate is greater than one, you have a risk of going to infinity. The output can be diverged. If that happens, that means the system is going to be unstable. So in design of IIR filter, because we are going to reuse these, we give us more restrictions. OK, so these are essentially what FIRIIR filters are. This is what was developed in 1970s to early 1980s. Because the required calculation was so, 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 I would say, bloody heavy. Why is bloody heavy? General purpose CPU employs an operation unit called ALU arithmetic logic unit. It does two things. It does addition. It doesn't even do subtraction. Subtraction is, is somehow done by using the addition by changing this to its negative representation. So it does only, it does only addition and the logic operation. And for something like this, if we rely on a general purpose, if general purpose computer, then delay, delay, that's fine. The multiplication, every single multiplication is going to convert it to n additions. So how many times of addition we are going to do? Countless, especially when the taps becomes long. And we develop something. Every single processing unit is not designed to perform addition, but to perform multiplication. Multiplication-based processor, that's, that's BSP processor. So we've got two examples. One is the Texas Instrument 32 series. They got 16 for a point, uh, 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 fixed point and uh, floating point. 32 these days they do have uh, higher bits. So they're quite mainstream for high-end application because they, they, they even do the military-grade chips. And slightly cheaper to low end of the market, you've got a Shark, which is analog device, DSP chips. I brought in a Texas Instrument card if you want to. Where's the card? Yeah. This is a 16-bit. The, the chip is, is, is there. This card is about 300, I believe. It's a development kit. But the actual chip itself is 10 US dollar, 10, 10 pounds. In this country, you buy a single, single chip of this kind is about 10 pounds. But in America, that's retail prices. 10 US dollar, but if you buy a thousand of them, it dropped down to 1.2 US dollar. Okay, for one buck you can get, uh, you can get a chip of this, which this thing performs if you do the speech signal processing way faster than today's i7 4 core, the 3 meg chip. Okay, uh, I, I have this at home, I just bought bought two sets of, the, of, of these uh, for uni. I try to play with them in my office. I've been working on these for years, years, years. OK, now, 80s. We got adaptive filter kicked in. So we design a high pass, low pass. But, you know, if we try to clean the speech in the train, in the aircraft, 
in the, in the cabin of an aircraft, and the noise vary over time. We don't know what to set the cut of frequency. We want something to 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 be able to follow what's changing in the environment. And uh, before that, and people also want to because to design high pass, low pass, band pass, or whatsoever you can think of, we always try to what to approximate a specific function. We we give a wanted response and we try to use a polynomial to somehow approximate it and every single polynomial has got its own characteristics in approximating these can we somehow specify a overall objective say for example minimum ripple so least square error Etc. Etc. If we can set a specific target, we use any optimization routine to design, design the internal parameter of a filter. Then that's called optimal filter. And if the filter itself adjusts its internal par par uh, parameter or reconfigures the internal parameter to represent the environment change, then that's adaptive filter. So essentially, you have a feedback get involved. The adaptation can be run continuously online, can be run during the design phase, depending upon. And essentially, you have a desirable signal, you have a error signal, you use the errors to change following some algorithm internal parameter so that the error is somehow, perhaps in a mean square sense, minimized. So we want a designed signal. Now the design of the, such kind of filter, the key is how to define the desirable signal. And there are many ways to try to pretend that we know what the desired signal is. For example, uh, for speech cleaning or for noise cancellation headphones, we only have the noisy signal. We don't have the desirable, which is the pure speech. Then we have different kind of configuration to pretend to some extent we know what the desired signal is. And they worked reasonably well and they succeeded. So this adaptive filter could take the FIR form and IIR form. So these are adaptive filters essentially. Nothing, nothing, nothing really horrendously complicated. Essentially, it's just a feedback loop with some optimization routine involved. So that is DSP. So anybody who wants a DSP can learn it. Uh, don't get scared about these kind of funny and very long, uh, ugly expressions. I wouldn't even call them formulae or call them uh, equations because they are just just the pi's and the sigmas multiplication and the additions are written in the in the nasty format plus some stats. So the AI kick in in 1990s, where I was lucky to 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 to, to study it. Well, I studied slightly before that uh, when it first first came in the 80s. So so what is learning? First thing, so learning is knowledge acquisition. And a, a little baby come in and they say, Dr. Uh, 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 Uncle Francis, and the, can, I, can I sit in this chair? A four year old baby, uh, not baby, uh, uh, a lad, and, and uh, uh, John came in and uh, oh, you can sit on it, this is not a chair, this is a table. Next time he repeat the same thing, I said, well, no, you can sit in it, uh, sit on it, but it's not the chair, it's a table. The third time he comes in and he said, well, can I sit on this table? So learning sometimes is done by iterative error correction. So adaptive filter is actually learned because the objective is to minimize, is to minimize the error. And that in the in the sort of artificial neural network or the machine learning sense, essentially we try to use a structure, which is an extended version of FIR and IIR. In adaptive filter, the filter structure itself, what the learning machine itself is an FIR and IIR. But for the machine learning, we slightly extend that to something inspired by the human brain. And, and in this way, we can use highly nonlinear internal representation to try and reflect what's happening from the data. So it's a data-driven model. Internally, it could be highly nonlinear. 
And uh, in 19, 1990, that was very, very hot. In year 2000, it's hot. In, 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 in year, year 2010, it starts to receive some kind of uh, uh, criticisms. Essentially, the first thing is a black box. Two is lack of analytical model. It requires large data set. The computational overhead could be high. And uh, uh, it's, you know some people say it's not quite AI because it does not address and the deduction and the induction does not involve any deduction and the induction and the, it does not involve knowledge representation so it is a machine learning so it shouldn't be called AI at that time uh, so these were the critics received and now they all removed the industry because Google welcomed it why because it is that kind of thing that does the job provided black box who cares um, what is the new regulation? GDPR. Is that GDPR black box or transparent box? No matter. So black box or transparent box, let's leave it with the politicians to discuss. Don't care. Lack of analytical model. Google cares about money and the revenue, etc. And, 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 you know, don't care. Analytical model, decent elegant or not large data set yes we have computing overhead yes we have the money we can buy put them on cloud don't care because we have the money we have the power we got the right of we got the right of uh, uh, we've got a uh, freedom of speech we say that's artificial intelligence then that is so, return. So what these are? What these are? It's the model starts from really 1943. Pitts from uh, uh, MIT again proposed that, that the single neuron in the brain may be modeled by a summation function or basis function and the activation function. Summation function essentially collects information from adjacent neurons, give it some kind of weights, symbol. Uh, here I represented W weight, one, two, three, I, that means it's I's neuron, add them all up. It's weighted sum to gather information. There's a threshold to make a decision. And if this uh, decision is positive, then this neuron is fired and then it outputs a positive pulse in that case. And the very simply, that can support decision. Okay, the decision is to make, is to be made tonight is for eat at home and eat out. Okay, then a number of factors I need to think. Maybe the weather should be think, should be taken into consider that's factor one, give it 0 0.3 weight. And how deep my pocket is, give it a second, uh, currently, how much dosh have I got in my pocket? And the number three is perhaps how much leftover or un unused food in the fridge. Yeah, all these take into account, put them in a specific weight. And the bias is, am I a homestaying B or a club or eating out person? So the, the bias, how high you are, then you can add something as a bias to it. Once this passed over a certain threshold, decision is made, hooray, go eat out. So this is what a neuron does. And the slightly more difficult, sometimes we do not want to make a black and white decision. We want a soft, oh, very likely whatsoever. We make it a continuous function. And we can use a sigmoid function. Sigmoid function, uh, the shape looks like a, a inverse tangent function. It's a, it's a threshold, but with these edges smooth, smoothen. So it's, it's something similar to that, but it's a smooth continuous function. Well, this end uh, uh, approaches plus one, the other end uh, to zero. Okay, so this is a single neuron. 
So the 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 the, the, the underlying the, the the underpinning principle was we believe the neurons are simple processing unit in our brain. A single neuron does very little, but this collective work of these massively connectionist delivers the so-called computing power of human brain, and then we get them networked together. One way of getting them networked together could be something like. But this is a very simple feed-forward structure. Each circle represents one of those. So because this is a non-linear function, then we involves a lot of non-linear processing, layer after layer, non-linear processing unit that can theoretically map arbitrarily complicated input and output relationship. The key is to find these weights so that desirable input and output relationship is achieved. So now, we're going to try somehow to achieve this. One way is to, to learn with a teacher. We have, oh, and I've got the distance learners or somebody on the other end. So if I point to the screen, nobody can see I do it here. If I expose the under training neural network, to a set of environmental variables or number. And we know what we expect from the neural network, so in that case, a teacher. Maybe this is an image of my table, and the teacher will say, this is a table, not a chair. And then the neural network not trained probably would start with outputting something arbitrary. And there is a discrepancy between what the teacher says and the under-trained neural network says. We find out the discrepancy, and we try to adjust the internal weights, which were the connection, the weights, many, many weights, in a way to minimize the error of these two. Once this is sufficiently minimized, sufficiently minimized, we believe the knowledge the teacher has been transferred to the neural network. So we can sack the teacher. Off you go. Uh, we don't need you anymore because your knowledge has been transferred to me. So replace the teacher with the neural network. And the teacher then get, get its P45 or whatsoever uh, of him go. And then the neural network will re replace him. So essentially, the algorithm could be made pretty simple because, because the error is determined by the neural for a single neuron, okay? The single ne neuron's output and the teacher value. And the aim is to minimize this total uh, error. And what we do is the error multiplied by the input to that particular neuron with a small learning rate, eta would be the adjustment of weight we will need for each step. So it's data driven. So it's data driven. So this kind of learning based upon the difference of teacher and the, the neural network output was proposed pretty early by neuroscientists in 1960s. It's called Delta Learning Rule. And then uh, if say we will, I will not tell John what to do. Let's do it unsupervised. Can a neural network learn without teacher if we don't know what to learn? So what we do is I go to I go to the high street and see you know everybody wears a pair of uh, a Beats headphones. I had this kind of a peer pressure, so I go and buy a pair of Beats. So what do you learn? Nobody teaches you that you should go and buy a pair of beads and wear them in the street because you see other people. Sometimes we call it peer pressure or whatsoever for the youngsters. And for, for us, basically, we try to stay in the crowd. They do not single ourselves out too much, just moderate ourselves and look at what's around in general. We just follow that trend. So this is kind of unsupervised learning. So this unsupervised learning typically picks up the most significant feature. It's, it's, it's pretty, pretty true in the, in the neuroscience. In, in 1949, there is a, a neuroscientist postulated a learning mechanism, it's Herbin learning. It basically says the most active neuron gets learned or gets trained. So what, what you get, what, which neuron gets most significant stimuli will get trained and get fired. It's, that's very, very early, early postulation. Eventually, it turns out to be true. If we have a single neuron, 
and say this neuron is so so simple that it doesn't even engage in activation function it's just a summation point a single node of summation what it does is the output the dynamic equation suggests that's it output is the sum uh, is the weighted sum of all its input and if we if we update it with a small something based upon its output used put as an adjustment so what does this adjustment mean it it is kind of feedback the adjustment is based upon the output and the input if the input and output are most correlated it gets enhanced does that make sense so the herding learning essentially is what is most correlated gets enhanced how a neural network will get its output most correlated to its input essentially that's the most active receives more most stimulus in this way you essentially once this converged we can mathematically prove it gets to the, the output becomes will converge ultimately to the maximum eigenvalue of your signal and we can line this up in the network we can line this up following this learning regime and then this will give us this will give us a artificial neural network which does the principal component analysis with all the output being the eigenvalues and with all the eigenvectors encoded in these weights so these are essentially so now the modern trends we know the googles and some other players bring back this neural network that, that means bring my second life back thanks for these uh, the sometimes known ethical i would say facebook and the google certain kind of information sharing a certain practice i wouldn't say was was in terms of the the, the, the ethics i put question mark you know i don't like certain things but thanks for those things we gain something we lose something we got big data we got all these things and i gained second life in neural networks so the current trends are about if you one is the deep learning Deep learning is uh, is sometimes termed as deep leaf network. There is no explicit definition. And any neural network or any trainable machine with multiple layers is called deep learning. So you can have two hidden layers in the in the feed forward network, and then you can you can term it as deep learning sometimes if you really want to. But typically the current deep learning in, involves like a two major block which is a hybrid model sort of like in the in initial layers we have some unsupervised learning essentially to extract features because we know unsupervised learning essentially grasp the features it, it, it identifies most significant ones sometimes we can slightly give it some kind of intervention to make it semi-supervised with some kind of purpose to attract the unsupervised learning to, to, to purposely learn something we want it to learn, but not give it a specific direction as for what to learn, what to remember. And the, 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 the second block typically is a very traditional supervised learning. So this is the kind of current deep learning, uh, the current deep learning. The second is the recurrent network. The recurrent network is nothing new. As early as 1990s, there were various kind of recursive models. That means get feedback involved, either locally or globally. Recall that a very, very straightforward, a simple feedwood, uh, feed forward network, you see the signal being applied on this layer and the feed forward to next layer in full connection and so on and so forth, without any localized feedback or global feedback. And indeed, in the neuron, in, in true neurons in, inside animal brains, there are loads of local and the global feedbacks. The feedbacks makes us cleverer and more accurate. And also the, the, the memory, much of the memory is associated with, with the feedback and a capability to, to, to manage our time. And uh, you know, if, even if you talk about the count of beats, 
If you do not really have feedback loops in your brain, you can't count the beats, I can tell you. Uh, okay, so add the feedbacks, where, 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 where about? And the, the third is the so-called spiking neural network. The model is no longer a nonlinear sort of activation function, but something, something fairly, something fairly strange with, with capacitors. The neural models are based upon the, the memory and the charge and discharge process. It's a first order charge and discharge process. In this way, we can model the time because see time constant gets involved at uh, the spike in neural network. Recurrent neural network has been old, has been mentioned, has been discovered or proposed in 1990s. The reason why that was not used is one is computing power issue, two is convergence issue, and these issues are no longer issues, and then, and then it's back. It's, it was known to be relatively difficult to try. Okay, so some examples. I can't give you exhaustively examples. So speech recognition, perhaps many people are interested in, it's no longer new technologies, it's mature something. And the mature something is essentially neural network based and the hidden Markov based. The hidden Markov model, the reason why we call it a hidden Markov model actually is a deep learning in today's terminology. It is a multi-layer neural network with the hidden layer being replaced or being, being replaced by Markov model. So the Markov model is in the sandwich. Is the meaty part of your sandwich. So that's a deep learning with the Markov model embedded in an artificial neural network. So the hidden Markov model based speech recognition was started by Microsoft Research based in Cambridge. They ever since they developed some sort of a toolkit. The toolkit was then in the public domain and, uh, and, and Google uh, developed in, in the late stage but uh, applied a much large data set and uh, achieve the much better results these days to make it truly so the speaker independent thanks to big data they managed to collect and the speaker recognition I just completed a PhD and the second PhD is co-supervised with um, uh, 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 Phil and uh, there is quite substantially development toolkit from Microsoft Research. Again, they now give the free, it's called MSR, Microsoft Identity Toolbox. If you really want a general purpose speaker recognition system, if you don't talk about robustness or et cetera, et cetera, you can, you can start from scratch and build up a system in a week, in a week, because it's got a universal background model. And if you enroll somebody into it, if you want to develop something quick, one week's job, even if you are, you, are, you are a new starter, I can build it up perhaps in a couple of days. Uh, so that's Microsoft Identity Box. If anybody is interested, they have a look at it. It's free now. And uh, one other thing is quite amazing and quite interesting about uh, music information retrieval. I'll just point you to some sources, resources. Perhaps the best ever developed and best ever used by actually main industry is something it's not quite well used. I don't know why. It's the Mercedes Music Refo uh, Information Retrieval System. Now it is written in in, in C, but you can compile it uh, to uh, executables, and uh, and then you can cross compile it to something. The MSR toolbox has got um, a MATLAB version, so everybody will feel happy with. So, what's the reason behind the return? As I've said, now. Uh, before I, 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 I conclude and before I, I before David is gonna try kill me and uh, I think you are you're you are about you're you are you're you are, you are, you are about to do some decimation. Decimation is a DSP word, but it actually doesn't sound good as it's like a killing. TPU. And uh, please do go and have a look if you're interested in DSP. The next tide of DSP these days, okay, people complain about Google complain about all the uh, whatsoever players. Oh, I don't have the engine on my machine. Everything I need to get online because they process this in the back end, et cetera, et cetera. Because the speaker, the, the OK Google thing is processed on their tensor processor. The tensor processor at the moment is only available, is only available on the cloud. It is a neural network based structure. It runs 
with something called the TensorFlow. TensorFlow is a new DSP language for machine learning for this kind of audio informatics developed to actually run these, these tensor processing unit. You can subscribe to Amazon or whatsoever, uh, a, a, a cloud service. You can specify you want a system with TPU. And to drive that TPU to execute your DSP or audio informatics commands, you need this. So if you are forward looking, if you are forward looking before people start to learn these sort of things, if you take the first bite of cherry, look at this, look at TPU, and you probably find your jobs easier. Okay, so to conclude, traditional DSP deals with that, and the audio acoustics DSP should embrace really four new technologies, namely big data, cloud computing, data-driven AI, or if you call it machine learning, software, hardware, code design, e.g. the development of TPU. And that's it from me today. Thanks for your accompaniment. Thank you. TPU is a big thing. And the tensor flow is a big thing. And you look at the, 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 the salary. If you look at American jobs or whatsoever, I don't know if, if, if the, the, the visa gets more and more difficult. If you look at American job sites, if you look at DSP, uh, DSP uh, uh, sort of development, who gets paid most? Tensor. Who knows about Tensor? Who knows about uh, Tensor Flow? MATLAB. <laughs> Well, but depending upon what you, if you do the front end, if you do the server and the cloud level of computing, because of the cloud, those who handles the clouds and those who develop those backend service get paid most. Okay, so we should move on. Uh, yeah, yeah. If you do, you want me to handle some questions now, or do? Yes, 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 yes. Otherwise, uh, otherwise he's going to kill me. Uh, thank you very much. And Mercedes and MSR toolbox are truly something. If you want to do this, don't forget to look at. And uh, it's pretty good.